Hi everyone, I'm Pei Tong, and I'm an incoming PhD student at UC Berkeley. I worked on this project when I was an AI resident at Intel. I collaborated with Casimir Wazinski and Lama Nachman, who are both at Intel. Those of you who designed user interfaces before know it's a very difficult process. There are so many guidelines to follow. Like, you need to make sure your interface is intuitive and efficient to navigate, and also you need to make sure it's not too cluttered. There's been a lot of prior work aimed at helping designers with this process. Researchers have developed metrics and models of human performance that designers can use to evaluate their designs, as well as tools and techniques that will optimize parts of the design, like the um, design's layout. Recently, there has been a shift from using analytical models of human performance to using neural networks. These data-driven models can detect complex patterns in the data sets, so they require less feature engineering than analytical models and have been shown to make more accurate predictions. For instance, Lee et al. created a model that takes in a menu and a sequence of menu items to select and will predict how long it takes to select each item in the sequence. A common way to train neural networks to fit a data set is with gradient descent, where gradients of the loss function with respect to the model's weights can be used to update the weights to minimize the loss function. Similarly, if we have a model that predicts human task performance for a given user interface, we could compute gradients with respect to aspects of the input UI, like for example, its layout, and then use the gradients to update the UI to optimize for predicted human task performance. We decided to explore the ability of this technique to improve an initial UI design. Here's a high-level overview of our approach. First, we need a model, so we extended Lee et al's model that predicts menu task performance to predict a task performance metric, which will be defined later, for ver various types of interactions on 2D mobile interfaces. To scope our work, we focused on improving the interface's layout. And by layout, I mean the size and location of all the elements, like the buttons and sliders, et cetera. So for our training data set, we generated over 100 different layouts of a single user interface, and then crowdsourced human task performance data for all the layouts. Next, we fitted our model to this data set and then developed a gradient descent-based algorithm that could update the layout to improve its predicted task performance. Finally, we applied our algorithm to improve layouts of two distinct UIs, including one that the model has never seen before, and verified improvements experimentally with crowdsourcing. First, some background on modeling human performance. Now, there are many factors that affect human task performance, which is a metric we defined that aims to capture how quickly and accurately users complete the tasks. And the factors include the time it takes to decide or figure out how to complete the task, visual search, which is the time it takes to find a target element, like a button to be tapped, and then the time it takes to perform the actual interaction, like the time it takes to tap on a button, and finally, learning effects, where users take less time as they become more familiar with the interface and tasks. So all these features are captured in either our model's features or architecture. So our model architecture was taken largely from DeepMenu, but we made some modifications. So our model takes in a UI and a sequence of tasks and predicts the task performance metric for each task. But we use a hierarchical LSTM model, and the recurrent layers help capture learning effects as users become more familiar with the UI. So on the left, we have the encoder. For each task, it takes in a sequence of feature vectors, one for each element in the UI that describe the UI element and task. And at the end of the sequence, it generates an embedding for the task in UI, which then goes to the predictor model that generates a scalar prediction for the task performance metric. So the entire UI is input for each task in the sequence because the UI may change after certain interactions. Like for instance, dragging and dropping an element will change its location for the next task. So compared to the menu model, we have an additional LSTM layer in both the encoder and predictor to account for the increased complexity of our problem. Our features were selected because they will have an effect on task performance. So for each UI element, we have 13 different features that could be divided into these four categories. We have the target feature, which indicates if the element will be interactive with during the task. And next we have the elements type, um, and the elements type affects its saliency as well as how users will interact with it. And then we have the layout features, so the size and location of each element. And our model also handles grouped elements, like a group of buttons enclosed in a container, and we have the corresponding layout features for the container. 
Then we have information on the elements label, like the where to vec embedding for the text label, which will affect how quickly users can find it. Then on the interaction level, we have two different features. We have the type of interaction, because different interactions take different amounts of time, and then the step feature. So our model handles tasks consisting of multiple interactions, and the users have to figure out how to break the task down into individual interactions. And this is a good measure of how intuitive the interface is. So the step feature indicates how difficult the particular interaction is for the user to figure out. For our data set to be useful for layout optimization, we have 108 distinct layouts of a single user interface. And it's a photo editing UI where you can add stickers and filters to a photo. And the image on the right shows the result after a few interactions. This UI has six different types of common UI elements and includes individual elements like this icon here, as well as grouped elements, like this group of buttons over here. For each layout, we have crowdsourced task performance values for each task in a comprehensive task sequence. This sequence is the same for all layouts and includes all possible interactions with this UI, where each element is interacted with at least five times. So here are some examples of the layouts in the data set. Out of the 108 layouts in the data set, five are considered good, which means they're designed to meet many design guidelines. And if they are bad, they violate many design guidelines. To ensure comprehensive coverage of the layout space, 100 layouts are generated randomly by two different techniques. We crowdsource the task performance data on Amazon Mechanical Turk. We assign at least three workers per layout, and we have 379 participants who completed 284 tasks. So we had data on over 100,000 tasks. So for each task, we collected the completion time and also whether or not the worker made an error on the task. So for each task, the workers first shown instructions for the task. And when they're ready to complete the task, they tap the start button and are taken to the UI to then complete the task. We aim for the task performance metric to capture how quickly and accurately people can complete tasks. So we define it with this equation. So we have the completion time for the task average across all workers assigned to the layout, and we threw out outliers. And this is increased by the fraction of workers who made a mistake on the task, and, this, and that's multiplied by a penalty value which is 0.8 for major errors, like accidentally canceling all your changes, and 0.5 for minor errors, like accidentally adding the wrong filter. We next trained and evaluated our model on the crowdsource data set. We used a target level R squared metric, which is also used by Lee et al. to evaluate their model. And it's defined as the R squared of the sequence of relevant tasks for each UI element. Like for instance, all the times the user interacts with the slider bar, and that's averaged across all the elements. So we achieved a target level R squared of 0.79 on our data set from um, six-fold cross-validation. And on the right, we plotted the predicted and actual task performance values for the slider bar interactions. Once we have a trained model, we can move on to layout optimization. We use gradient descent, which iteratively updates the input to minimize the objective function. But the equation for a single update is given here. So theta is the input for the inf update step and it's obtained from theta at the previous step, updated by the gradient of the objective function, multiplied by the learning rate. For our case, theta is the layout features, so the size and location of each element, as well as the corresponding container layout features for grouped elements. Our objective function is the sum of the predicted task performance values for the entire task sequence, plus some penalty functions that check for undesirable situations, and will add a large value to the objective function when they detect those situations. In more detail, when we update each UI element independently, we may end up with undesirable situations, like two UI elements overlapping, or elements going out the boundary of the phone screen. And with differentiable penalty functions, we can steer the gradients to eliminate these situations when detected. Also, if designers will like a certain outcome in their um, optimized layout, like making sure two elements are the same size, they can enforce these custom constraints with penalty functions. So we start by applying our optimization technique to new layouts of this photo editing UI. Now, since we're optimizing for task performance, to ensure that the output has good aesthetics, we added some custom constraints via penalty functions. So the um, optimized layout had a predicted performance improvement of 6.3%. And to verify that this optimized layout actually had better human performance, we once again crowdsourced task performance from Amazon Turk. But this time we assigned at least 10 workers to each layout. We observed an improvement of 8.9%. 
So the um, improvement in task performance is likely due to the increase of, in size of certain UI elements, as well as the increased distance between some of the UI elements, and also the grouping of the sticker and the sticker buttons. So we output the layout after each update step. So one cool thing we can do is animate the optimization process. So when it says invalid, like there are elements overlapping or going out of bounds, and then time is the sum of the task performance values for the entire task sequence, and time plus penalty is the objective function. We also tried optimizing a layout that was initially good. We first tried optimizing with lots of custom constraints like before, but the output did not show much improvement in predicted performance. And since constraints and since constraints limit exploration, we decided to relax the constraints. But then the UI elements are misaligned in the output layout, and some of the elements are too small. So the output layout was tweaked slightly. But the tweaks are very trivial and straightforward and just involve enlarging elements that are too small and also aligning elements to make the output look more aesthetically pleasing. So the optimization algorithm probably misaligned the elements because um, misaligned elements tend to stick out more and they're hence easier to find, so the task performance will be better. And experimentally, we found a small improvement in task performance, but it's a smaller improvement compared to the previous example. But it's probably because it's harder to improve a layout that's already quite good. So the improvement in performance is likely due to the increased spacing between some of the UI elements. In order for our optimization algorithm to be useful, it has to be generalizable. Like designers should not have to collect task performance data for every UI they hope to optimize. Otherwise, it'll just be like A-B testing. But fortunately, relationships between task performance and layout attributes are mostly universal. To assess the generalizability of our model, we applied our model trained on the photo editing UI to optimize a new UI. It's a recipe planning interface where users specify ingredients they'd like and dislike by dragging and dropping them to an appropriate box. And when they're done, they'll tap the Get Recipe button to see a list of recipes they may like. So in order for a model to optimize well, all element and interaction types in this UI are also found in the photo editing UI. But the UI element types in the photo editing UI are quite general and can be used to build a large variety of user interfaces. For the optimization of this recipe planning UI, we came up with a similar realistic and comprehensive task sequence, and then performed the layout optimization with the model trained on the photo editing UI. So here's an example of an initially bad layout that was optimized using very few constraints, because optimizing using lots of constraints did not show much improvement in predictive performance. So then we had to tweak the output. So we crowdsourced task performance, and it showed a 9.2% improvement. And this could be due to the fact that the ingredients were moved closer to the drop targets. So here's an example of an initially good layout. We crowdsourced task performance, which showed a 4.9% improvement. And this could be due to the fact that the ingredient stickers were smaller, so the drop targets were closer together. Also, the undo icon and the Get Recipe button were moved closer to the right to make it more accessible to right-handed users, which make up the majority of the user base. So we did pass in a fraction of left-handed users to the model. So what can we learn from all this? We demonstrated that this technique is able to update UI layouts to have improved task performance, and that the model is able to generalize and improve layouts of new UIs that it has never seen before, which means that this technique has potential to be used in practice. And as you saw in the optimization results, some human input could be used to improve the algorithm's output via specifying constraints or making minor tweaks to the output. But studies have shown that collaboration between a human and AI is encouraged over relying solely on either because both human judgment and computer optimization can be misleading and they can fix each other's mistakes. This layout optimization system has many uses. The designer can use the model to compare the task performance of their handcrafted layouts. And they can use the optimization algorithm to generate layout alternatives with better task performance. And the system also provides a platform for human AI collaboration, where a designer and the system can work together to develop a great layout. So to summarize, we extended an existing neural network model to predict task performance and mobile UIs with a variety of UI element types and an expanded interaction range. We then developed an algorithm to improve layouts of mobile UIs using gradients of this trained model, and also demonstrated that this model can generalize to new UIs. So this layout optimization system can help designers in various ways, also provides a platform for human-AI collaboration. Well, thank you for listening.